So, uh, welcome to another war game review from the playersaid.com. Um, this, I guess, I'm not really, not really a war game review. More of just a quick look at the lock and load tactical solo system. So we've, you know, there's been reviews on our channel for lock and load tactical for the Falklands, Heroes of the Falklands. We did, I think, a while back. We took a look at Heroes of the Pacific. Grant's looking at Heroes of Normandy. I mean, there's a ton of titles in this series. Um, each title has its own units, its own flavor, its own special rules, its own scenarios, ton of stuff going on. Um, each of them very different, so just pick a theme and go for it. Uh, pick a period, pick an army, pick whatever you want and go for it, because this has almost anything you could want. Um, at least from World War Two onwards, you, you know, Vietnam's in this, this they're just everything. Um, pick a game, go for it. Now, if you want to play it solitaire, um, outside of doing I go, you know, just doing best possible move, more than happy to do that. But if you wanted um, a less predictable, more kind of an AI, there is a generic solo module. That can be used with any of the lock and load tactical game titles, and in it there's a there's there's, there's quite a bit of stuff. In this there's a there's a whole extra kind of rule book, uh, which was very digestible, nothing scary, and literally half of this is a huge example of what to do. Oh, if a card says this, do that. If a card says this, do that, and shows you with like diagrams. This is actually really good and was very very helpful. But giving you an idea of how to how to use the AI is the AI, and I'm gonna tell you, it was a little bit daunting at first. So the AI uses this deck of cards, and the deck of cards, and I'll kind of show you a bit up close later. We'll do do some examples. The deck of cards has a ton of stuff on it, and it's just a ton of different orders and priorities and things that the AI is going to try and do on their turn, or at least on their impulse, right? So it might just say, you know, unit closest, if a unit's adjacent to an enemy, they are going to fire. Usually it's a very obvious who they're going to fire. If they're adjacent to only one unit, that's who they're going to go against. But if there's choices to be made, you have one, two, three, Four, five, and these are uh, most of these are double side. You get all these big flow charts, so this does kind of take a little bit of space and a little bit unwieldy. So if I have to make a choice about a fire action, I consult. And right now we're looking at this is the fire action flow chart right here, and you just follow the flow chart. So am I firing a multi-man counter? Let's say yes. I've got a rifle, so weapon, and firing. Does the does the AI have a line of sight to a player unit in a spotted hex. Why yes, yes I do. I Let's say I've spotted two. Uh, I can see I'm, I'm adjacent to two guys. Um, do any of them have ordnance? If one of them has like a mortar or an anti-tank weapon, mm, let's say they do. So I, I would choose one of them that does. Can that, can, can I Can I try to damage that player unit? Yes, then I will fire the unit with the ordnance. If the if they if neither of them do have ordnance, spotted hex containing PUs needed for victory. So is one of those two adjacent enemy units on a victory condition? Why yes, one of them is. Obviously kill them with a victory condition. And, and most of that would seem obvious, but if it's not, then you fire on the closest PU if in a spotted hex which you then have to make a choice, and so you would then start doing do other thing. But the, the play charts, these flow charts, once you read through them a couple times, pretty intuitive. You do the most sensible thing. Um, now, whilst these flow charts might give you a very sensible thing to do, what's really interesting to me are these cards. And the cards, um, that's where the unpredictability may lie. And so, because sometimes you get, um, it might be like, 
quite obvious that you're like, this person should fire, or like, this thing should stay where it is, but sometimes the card says like, um, do something, do this slightly different thing, and you're like, okay, what is happening? And there were at times where I was kind of like, head scratching of like, what on earth happened? Like, why are they doing this? They're kind of putting themselves, like this is a very risky gambit, or this little bit and piece doesn't really make sense. But then, at the end of the scenario that I played, um, the, the, the AI was like, they had won the scenario. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess the, those kind of odd things that happened were that they ended up with the game, so pff, what do I know? Um, and what I did was I tried to do kind of a, a, at least a somewhat robust test of this. Because there's, so in this deck of cards, it, it becomes modified based on the objective of the AI player. Um, you, you can figure out pretty easily from the scenario, is it a defensive posture or an offensive one? You know, is it, does the AI have to go and capture something or move off board or, or go and kill someone? Or are they trying to hold an objective or trying to do a rear guard, you know, are they trying to, this defensive posture, and if it's unclear, you go offensive, right? Um, and what that does is that alters the composition of this deck. There's a whole extra set of cards here, right here. These are the defensive ones. And here you've got kind of all the neutral ones plus all the offensive ones. And I wanted, to, what I wanted to do is I wanted to test the offensive ones. Because having an AI play defensively, that's pretty easy to design. You say, I hold, I shoot with the nearest or the most powerful enemy, right? Designing it, designing it, a holding pattern AI is much easier than something that's got to do kind of a complex. And this is, this is the Falklands, remember? The Argentinians had to do, they did a naval landing and they had to take a position on map 11, and then they had to turn, um, they had to turn east, or no, they had to turn west, and then shoot across the map, and take a fortified position on a hill, basically, and do that within seven turns. And so I was like, can an AI reasonably do that? And I'll tell you this, the AI reasonably did it. And so I, I was actually very, very impressed. I, I, about halfway through the game, I thought, uh, okay, not really sure what's happening. But that was more to do with the scenario than the AI. Because I was kind of, these initial landings, I had a, I was dealing with them at least, and I was like, there's no way they can get the, the, the other stuff across the map. Then the Argentines landed their main force, the, their marines, in, the, in these kind of amphibious craft and just plowed across the map on the roads, and I couldn't stop them. And then they just unloaded a ton of guys, and I was like, oh, okay, that's reasonable. And then all of a sudden, basically with one turn left, I was like, okay, great. <laughs> I was in a pretty bad spot, and I lost to the AI. But that's really good, that's good news, that's what I want, that's what I want to see, I want an AI to be good enough to, to kind of like, beat me, so to speak, right? I want it to be a challenge. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna pay for a solo module, it better be good. And that's really what I wanted to test. Can it, can it do something as complex as a landing, take a few objectives, and, and make that work? Can it do it successfully? And it, for me, it has done that. And it did that mostly with actually doing the cards, and following the flow charts. And there was very rarely a time where I had to kind of override the card because it was it was too dumb. Uh, a lot of the times, and I'll show you this, if the flow chart kind of comes up with like, there's nothing for you to do with this, it says like, move on, like move to the next order or flip the next card. Like this is, this is silly, this isn't working. Just like go to the next one. So it knows to a certain extent, if it's if it's being dumb, uh, but again, there are times where it does things that are very cavalier, which I like because I feel like I play that way as well sometimes. 
Grant would say otherwise. He would say I play very defensively. <laughs> but, but when it gets to it, you just want to get in there and get it done. And I felt like there were times where the AI was doing that. They were like, like caution to the wind, it would go out and do things. And I'm like, okay, that really puts me on the back foot because I wasn't expecting you to be quite that brazen and bold. Um, and, I, and I enjoyed that. I thought that was a good um, sign that the AI in this solo system worked well. So I'm going to just show you real quick just a little bit about how it works and what you can expect and then I'll uh, wrap up with a few just final thoughts. So as far as the solo module goes, um, a lot of it is powered by this deck of cards. It's a huge stack of cards and you actually don't use all of these in the traditional sense. You're not going to plow through them all and then reshuffle. You actually shuffle them pretty regularly. Basically, when it becomes the AI player's turn, you just flip a card and see what happens. And so you kind of read the card top to bottom, trying to do the one thing that it says that you're allowed to do in the impulse. So what you might look at here is you might say, um, so this first line, these are kind of priority secondary, you can kind of see that. So you try to do this first line. And this red one means if you have a unit that is adjacent to an enemy, try and do this one. So let's say, if you look kind of up here, I got these Argentine units, and they are adjacent to these guys up in the building. So what I'm trying to do is I try to enter melee, and if I can't do that, I try to overrun them if the firepower is greater than the target. And if I can't do that, then I try to fire. So that's pretty simple, right? I try to do all those things, and if, and if I can't do any of those things, like, or if I don't have anyone who's adjacent, then I mo would move on to this thing. So I look for anyone who's within two hexes of an enemy, I would fire at the closest vehicle. If I don't have anyone that's two hexes away that can fire at the closest vehicle, then I would try to lay smoke. Laying smoke enables you to move with some cover, so I would, I would try to do that. If I can't do that, then I would execute counteractions. Well, what's executing counteractions? Well, let's go and take a look. This is where you start to get into these big old flow charts. And this one's victory condition, so here we go. Oops, not try not to make a huge mess. So this is the Counteractions behavior flowchart. So tr try and do counteractions. You kind of start over here. This is offensive posture, which they're in. So, are there AI units off the map? No, no, there aren't. Are there good order a a AI weapon teams with line of sight? No, I don't have any weapons teams. Are there good order AI vehicles with line of sight? Why no? No, there aren't. Just for the sake of it. Are there good are there good order multi man encounters in line of sight and in range? Well yes, yes there are. So I would go up here, fire at closest player unit that can be damaged. Boom. Pretty really easy. If there weren't any, I would say, are there any sniper on the map? Oh yes, there is a sniper. Fire sniper at the farthest player unit. So and, and this gives you kind of how that works. And if you kind of get all the way to the end, no, 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 it would say, just to the next order, if you can't do any of this other stuff. You go back to your little card, that was, that was this one, well, go to the next order, that's what that flowchart said. So this is, um, the AI weapons team farthest from the lowest firepower PU opens fire. If you don't have any weapons teams, you look down here. Okay. AI farthest from the lowest firepower PU opens fire. And so I'm looking over here. Let's see, you've got some, like a weapon. And I'm farthest from. So, eh. So I'm the, my furthest unit firing at the lowest. Uh, firepower play unit. So let's see, we got this team and a little sniper. 
Uh, they're both the same. That's a terrible example. But basically, you end up with, see, you have a couple guys. These are kind of equidistant. I'm going for the one that had the highest firepower. This guy is a one. And he's got a little support weapon of a two. So he's got the highest firepower, so I would open fire on him. So I'm gonna just try and lay waste to him. That's what the kind of tells me. But that's that's honestly, that's how the system works. It's a really, really simple AI in the sense of how it functions. Now, as you can tell, these are some pretty detailed orders on here. So whilst reading them and understanding them are easy. This AI is pretty intelligent. This one talked about using weapons teams. This one's here is like, you know, if you have a shaken unit closest to a victory condition, if it's in a zero terrain modifier, move towards the terrain with a positive modifier. That's about rearranging your forces when you have shaken units near victory condition. So you're like, get this guy into cover so he can protect the victory conditions with his last dying breath. That's really cool. I really enjoy that kind of stuff. And I think this system does a really good job of kind of covering all the bases. And then, you know, it's consulting the flowcharts and the flowcharts start getting into using snipers, using heroes and medics, using all their special abilities that you know, tells you when when you want to do a fire action how best to go about doing it if you want to do combined fire should you basically is what that goes on um you know when the card says execute victory conditions there's a whole flowchart of how to get your victory conditions and they say you know if it does this, move to the victory condition. Or kill the guy that's near the victory condition so that your next unit can move up to the victory condition. Things like that. It does a really neat job of doing that. Uh, but, but honestly, that's a lot of kind of how that works. If you ever get lost, and it's kind of like, what am I supposed to be doing in here? This is the, kind of the, the solo rule book. It gives you really good examples of like, how to read this card. What does that mean? What does this that translate to? How do I follow the flow charts and try to understand it? And then, how does that play out on this map? They have this extended example going along of how to do it. So this is a really helpful resource and a helpful guide. Do not discount that. And then, so this is kind of an offensive posture because I had the, uh, I had the AI invade and then move across the board and take these out here and if you are playing a defensive against like the AI wants to be the defender you would just swap sub out all the offensive cards for all these defensive ones and if you look at these defensive ones it's kind of like you know it's it's all about making dynamic moves away retreating from the enemy going back towards um, victory conditions trying to like hold them off um, using um, dynamic moves is basically like low crawling away so they can't get you or using stealth move things like that trying to evade the enemy and they keep your strong points but honestly that's a lot of how this system works it just utilizes the main rules but it gives you priorities about how what the enemy's trying to do so that's just a quick look at that and we'll wrap up with a few final thoughts here so that was kind of a look at least a little bit at the, the cards there and, and the and the plates and that's the one thing i'm gonna say um lock and low tactical does have a lot of play aids and that's to compensate from the huge 5.0 rule book once you read most of that you can do it all from the play aids um pretty easily and then but still I have like the, the big charts out like you saw, but then I've got a ton of flow charts from all of these other AIs. This is a lot. This is a lot of stuff. I'm not gonna lie. So I'm like shuffling through these to do what it needs to do, and eventually you learn 
basically the most common things, especially because some aspects of your board won't change very much. So you're like, okay, this person's doing the same thing that they did last time, so you can just do it again. Um, the cards are very good. I really like them. I like that they're oversized, which means they're not getting lost amongst other stuff. It does give me a lot of, um, a lot of similarity, or, or at least not similarity, a lot of similar feel to the solo module in 65. And to a small extent, I haven't really explored it in Conflict of Heroes. You know, it uses a lot of a similar ideas where you have like, uh, here's your priorities, do this and this, and if not, do this. And then there's a decision matrix to be made. 65 is a really sm simplified decision matrix because the boards are so small in scale that, you, you know, every move is a good move, basically. It's very difficult to get lost. In, in lock and load, the maps are at a much larger scale. It's a lot more hexes, um, a lot more different bits and pieces going on. So, yeah, there's a lot, m there's a lot more decisions to be made, and that's why you end up with some a pretty significant amount of um, flow charts here, because there's much more that they could do, um, and so so you have to have a bit more of a a bit, a bit more input, so to speak, into the AI. And that's where I ended up, you know, sometimes you do have to make a, a little tweak in the decision making or, you know, kind of fudge what it is they're trying to do if you feel like it's being completely ridiculous. Like, if, if something would actively harm the, what the AI is trying to do, that's where I step in and like, they're not doing that. If they do something which might be just kind of weird or I don't understand or something neutral, I'll, I'll let the AI do its thing because there might be a secondary effect or a follow on the next time they pull a card that makes that pretty important. But when it's like, oh, they charge into melee and it's like, it's like one guy and he's charging into a thing of seven guys, uh, you know, it's why would you do that? There, there, are, there are times where it's like, it's not worth it. Um, that's, but, but overall, Pretty robust system, very happy with it. It does take a little bit of space. Um, that was something where I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta make a bit more room for it. So that that's just something to to consider. I do, I did use the X maps, and I will almost always use the X maps just because I like the space. There can be some pretty hefty counter stacks just with all the different units, support weapons, vehicles statuses, things like that. Things can get pretty wild, but I like the hex maps because they hit they bigger. They're bigger hexes, bigger maps. I'm just blown up. Uh, but with that, it is a little bit sizable, but honestly, picking up the solo module, this rulebook was very helpful. It's really, I'll be honest, it's like 12 pages of rules. There's a little card which has some like random events and stuff which you can optionally add in if you wanted more of that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the cards are, are very good, they're very clear. It says, you know, if you're adjacent to an enemy, do all this stuff. If you're not, do all this stuff. And, you know, if you're like nothing, you know, in there, do all this stuff down here. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool system and I think it, it's really good. I do, I would recommend this. It's entirely unnecessary, but I do recommend it nonetheless. You can play any of these lock and load tactical games with just, you play both sides. But if you want something that's somewhat unpredictable, that's going to give you an unknown, um, this, is, this is worth the investment, I think. And it's worth the investment because it is a generic system. You don't have to buy a solo module for each different one. It is generic, so it can be applied to all of the ones that you have ever bought in this series. And that's where I think um, this this is a winner. Um, I think about like Conflict of Heroes, they have a solo module for Awakening the Bear, but for Guadalcanal, they don't, because it's not a generic system, because that has its own stuff in it. Um, that's something that really appealed to me about this solo system. You can use it with them all. 
I can just take this and I can play Heroes of the Red Star, which I've got. Spoiler alert, that's coming up. Or I can play it with Heroes of Normandy. I can play it with Heroes of the Resistance. I mean, there's just... That's what's really fun about this solo module. I only have to learn it once. I can just stick this with any other module and I'm good to go. So, again, if you like the lock and load tactical system, if you, you know, if you, if you've never played it before, I do recommend it. I think it's really neat. It gives you a lot of detail and it is very fun. And it, it's, there's some really different parts to it compared to other tactical games. Um, it's a, got a huge selection of titles, so you can kind of pick whatever theme, so to speak, that you want, whatever period, whatever army that you want. Oh, I want to play that. Go for it. There's like every nationality under the World War II sun. That's not true, but there's a lot. Uh, there's modern ones like Falklands. There's a Middle East one. There's a kind of 1980s Germany, Cold War gone hot. That's Heroes of the Red Star, I have that. There's a ton of stuff like that. So pick whatever you want. You can get a generic solo module for it to give you that edge, right? It's better than just playing against yourself because you can never surprise yourself. But this solo AI can surprise you and it did do it a few times and it was, it, it was intuitive and it was intelligent. Um, at least it became intelligent if you let it do its thing for a bit. Sometimes you just gotta have faith in the system and eventually it does stuff and you're like, okay, that's what it was trying to do. Um, sometimes you just have to kind of let, just let it go. Um, you know, it might, you're like, this is dumb, what am I doing? Next turn, it makes sense. And you're like, oh, okay, great. Now I'm like pinned. I mean, oh, I was doing this pin somebody, you know. It does things which can be surprising, which is, that's what you want in a solo module. That's pretty much all you can ask from a solo module. So appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, this has just been some ramblings about the Lock and Load Tactical Solo System. Um, you pick it up at any good retailer. <laughs> uh, I do. I do recommend it's an investment in this in the tactical system. If you're buying those titles, pick up the solo module. It means you can play around on your own and uh, and and do it successfully uh, and do it well as well. I, there's probably very few scenarios this couldn't be applied to. They say in the in the solo rules, they're like, you might find one or two where it's like, this doesn't work. If, if And I imagine that's more to do with if it has really weird victory conditions or, it, or the, the enemy has to try and do something really weird. Um, but the, I have yet to find that. I've yet to find what that would be like. So, again, lock and load tactical system. This is the solo module. Uh, I have really enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. And I've been Alexander from theplayersaid.com.